Have you been wanting to stream your favorite retro games? Hooked up your systems to your old TV and they look great, then got all the hardware needed to connect to your stream setup? It's this guy, by the way. Only to find out that on stream, they look like this. Whoa! Today's video will show you how to fix all that. Right after, a word from this video's sponsor. Did you miss the Nerd or Die Summer Sale, but you still want a discount on some of the best and most customizable graphics for your stream, including alerts, overlays, transitions, and an easy one-click setup? Well, the first 100 of you to use coupon code EV50 can save 50%. It's the gift that keeps on giving, as it works on bundles as well. That's EV50 at checkout over at eposvox.gg slash nerd or die. You're welcome. In case it's unclear, I really like playing older video games, and as I've finally finished out my retro room here for streaming, I want to stream more of them. So I've been looking into the best ways to upscale those video games for live streaming. Now, this is part one of a multi-part series, because there are a lot of different hardware options when it comes to upscaling your video games that you could consider and use as well, which will get you all the way up from these older composite S-Video and so on signals up to 1080p and do a really good job at it. This video is more intended for people that don't have a big budget to spend, just want something quick and easy to plug in, and then optimizing those settings within OBS Studio, because I think that's the important part. We'll have a part two coming to talk about actual scalar hardware and things like that, for those of you with a bit more of a bigger budget. Buckle in, because this is going to get a little technical, but I think I can make it pretty simple and straightforward for pretty much all of you. I mean, Postbox, your stream professor, and before we get into the software side of this, you do need some hardware in order to get your retro game consoles connected to a modern capture card. Unfortunately, capture cards these days are not built with composite S-Video or component inputs. And even the older ones, like the original Elgato Game Capture HD, the way they handled those signals was very blurry, very messy, not super great, and I honestly don't recommend most of them. In fact, there are some data path capture cards that were used back in the day that can get you true 240p support and things like that out of your consoles, but they require such fine tuning and manual timings and all this stuff that personally, it's not something I want to mess with. I will point you to Retro RGB, a uh, great blog uh, headed up by Bob over there, does a lot of great stuff. They have some videos and posts about how to really fine tune all of that stuff. I'm instead going to point you to a couple devices that do a much better job and are actually pretty affordable for this purpose. This is the RetroTINK 2X line of line doublers. These are essentially upscalers for your older systems. I have the RetroTINK 2X Pro, which is fairly new. The original one, which is now called the Classic, which is only going to be continue to be sold for a little bit longer, uh, but it is cheaper than the Pro and is just as good for most people. They also just announced the RetroTINK 2X Mini. The RetroTINK 2X Mini only has composite S-Video and then audio inputs, doesn't have the component inputs, but otherwise has pretty much everything else the other RetroTINK products have, and they're only going to be $69.99 MSRP. Now, pre-orders haven't started yet, it just got announced, uh, but for most people who don't want to buy a bunch of more expensive cables for their systems, who just already have something ready to go, I'm going to recommend you probably get this. Now, if you want a little bit more flexibility and you want component inputs for PS2, uh, the Wii, you want the option to connect Nintendo GameCube if you get some of those new component cables for it, the original Xbox, things like that, then you will need the Classic or the new Pro as they have component inputs as well. I do want to talk about cables for a second as well. You may already have composite video cables for your system, but if you don't have S-Video cables, I highly recommend, even if you buy cheaper ones, which is going to be considered a sin among the retro community, but even if you buy cheaper S-Video cables, they're still going to give you a significant increase in quality over composite. Composite just has so much flickering, so much mess. S-Video is really a significant upgrade over it. And I'm showing some examples on screen here because it was really that big of a difference. Now you can go even further in this. And for a lot of consoles, they have component cables from a company called HD Retrovision. They have 
very finely tuned and engineered for specific consoles component cables which work to get the best possible signal out of it bypassing the composite and s video options entirely out of some systems such as the ps1 if you use the the genesis component cable plus the ps1 adapter on the ps1 it bypasses the component or the composite and s video signals to get rgb which is a lot cleaner it has each channel separated so you get a much sharper image they have cables for a lot of stuff but they are expensive but I do recommend if you're looking for an upgrade path, I'd say go with the S-Video cables for your systems now with the RetroTINK 2X, and then look to buy HD RetroVision cables later on. This is not sponsored or anything like this, but I can I can only just insanely strongly recommend you pick up a RetroTINK device for yourself for this because it will make your life a lot easier. What this device actually takes is it takes your analog video signals, which are not compatible with normal HDMI formats, and it outputs a lag-free 480p signal. It'll either line double your 240p games up to 480p, or it'll just de-interlace your 480i games to 480p. It won't accept 480p input, unfortunately. And then outputs that via mini HDMI, or full-size HDMI, depending on which one of these you get, to either your capture card or TV. This makes it much more compatible with TVs in the first place, and it makes it more compatible with capture cards, because most capture cards I have reviewed work fine with 480p. It will be a 720 by 480 60 FPS signal ready to rock and roll to stream. Why would you not? Like I said, it's also lag free because it's just line doubling. It's not doing any proper scaling or anything like that. They do also have smoothing filter options. I don't recommend using them for 2D, you know, sprite based games, but for some 3D games, the filter actually does work. Once you have one of these, connect your game console to the video terminals, depending on which input you're using. Plug in micro USB for power, plug in your HDMI cable to your capture card for capture, and then you have an input button for selecting your input between composite, S-video, and component. Uh, if it's black and white, because you have S-video, that means you're on composite instead of S-video, so click it again. You should be good to go. And then you have the button to control the smoothing filter. You can kind of toggle it on and off if you want it yourself. Once it's hooked up to your capture card, your capture card's hooked up to your PC, then you go ahead and open up OBS Studio add your capture card as a source, but instead of leaving it on defaults, you want to specify the resolution because the scaling aspect that we're doing in OBS Studio to get it up to 1080p to look nice and neat, these details matter. The, the, these little details that I'm gonna be covering here literally are the difference between having a high quality, sharp, upscaled video for your viewers and a blurry mess. So add your capture card as a video capture source, and then you need to specify the resolution as 720 by 480. Set your frame rate to 5994 or 60, depending on what you use. I always recommend 5994. I can talk about that later. And then you will want to specify the chroma subsampling range or the color range uh, for your video. Or these capture cards, for the capture cards coming from this, in terms of color range, full versus partial, I recommend just leaving it on default. The capture card will detect whatever the retro tink is outputting and be good to go. Leave it on default for 601 versus 709 as well. However, I would specify the color format. This is YUY2, MJPEG, I444, XRGB, and this will depend entirely on your capture card. If you're using an Elgato capture card, most of them will only support NV12. They will have the other options listed, but those are emulated in the driver and they don't actually support them. They only really operate in the NV12 color space. The cam link operates in YUY2, so that is an option. I would go with that. Otherwise, if you're looking for a capture card choice, I would look for something that supports 444 chroma subsampling. This means that the color ratios are not compressed at all. It's completely uncompressed. 444 is the way to go for that. Uh, NV12 is 420, which means each block of color is compressed more and you lose color detail, which for sprite-based and lower resolution games, when you're scaling them up, you'll get ringing in your text. You'll get colors that aren't exactly scaled how we want because it doesn't have that information anymore. You want to bring in the highest quality signal that you have available. I will have a list on screen and in the video description of capture cards that I know for sure support 444 RGB if you're looking to pick one up for yourself. If that's available to you, YUY2 or 444 will improve your results. Otherwise, stick with NV12. Avoid MJPEG and H.264 based capture cards at all costs. So that means the results that you're going to get out of something like the $20 can't link cover viewed will be much worse than something like the 444 output of the Magewell or Live Gamer Ultra or Live Gamer 4K or an even worse and still worse than the NV12 output of an Elgato capture card. Once you have that set up, you'll probably notice that you have a small little picture in the center of your OBS window. Don't go scaling that up to your full screen yet. That that's not going to be the right way to go. Instead, right click that source, go to transform edit transform. 
If you're working within a 1080p canvas, then all you can fit is a two time scale of that 480p, which comes out to 1440 by 960. It is important if you want the sharpest and cleanest results to work with even integer scales of the resolution you're working with. So this is a two time scale of 480p. This will not fill your window. You're going to have some black borders that you're either going to have to deal with with your overlays or things like that. But you're also going to run into that anyway, because not every game runs at the same ratio or resolution. It's easy to think looking back at CRTs because they adapted everything properly, that games all ran at exactly 240p in 4x3 and all of that. But even just looking at this, you know, Tomb Raider versus Crash Bandicoot, Crash Bandicoot has some black bars on some letterboxing that isn't present on Tomb Raider. And that's just how the game rendered and ran. And so you'll kind of need to have some wiggle room for those black bars in the first place. Once you put in the 1440 by 960 resolution in your transform options, click OK, and then right click the source again, transform center to screen. That way it's in the center and then you can move it based on the layout that you build around it from there. We're not done yet, though. Right click that source again, go to scale filtering and choose area. For the vast majority of retro games, especially pixel art or, you know, sprite based games, area is going to be the best upscaling method. I compared all of them. You can see kind of the differences here. Area is by far the sharpest and most consistent quality, and it's built for these kinds of upscaling. Ideally, when you're doing upscales of retro video games, you want nearest neighbor upscaling, which means that it literally just duplicates the pixels, much like how these are line doublers that literally just double the lines that exist. That is essentially what happens with nearest neighbor scaling. I'll point you to a post from actually two posts, one from Taryn from Linus Tech Tips talking about scaling options. Uh, he has a whole actually probably multiple videos at this point ranting about that. And then again, Bob from Retro RGB has a nice post about this as well for doing so in virtual dub. Area is the closest you can come to in OBS Studio or your live stream. It will get you the best results. For some older, like say PS2, Xbox era 3D games, uh, you can go with Lanxos or uh, Bicubic for the best results, but you'll have to play with it and test for yourself to see what looks better. But for most retro games, area is the way to go. Now you have your video here. Now you could go ahead and crop off the black bars, scale it up fully, but you're going to introduce what's called shimmering where your pixels don't, you know, they're not evenly scaled properly. So they're going to like look like they're kind of flickering or changing color a little bit as it goes because it's scaling them non-linearly and you know, it won't be an exact scale. It just won't be quite as sharp. So my recommendation is to stick with the two times scale and build a layout around it. So build you up a little frame for it or, you know, whatever and scale it based on that. You can do whatever you want, though. This is just the best way to get started, and then you can scale from there. But for your Twitch streams or your YouTube videos, instead of doing all of this in post or relying on more expensive hardware to scale it for you, IMO, this is the way to go to get the sharpest retro game captures in OBS. And it does benefit even low bitrate Twitch streams, you know, garbage in, garbage out. It does benefit you to have the highest quality up front and the sharpest image up front so that you can get the best looking streams for your viewers because nothing's worse than playing your favorite video game from when you were a kid and throwing it up on your big screen or on your live stream and it's just this blurry mess and viewers do notice that like they'll notice the difference between someone who's scaling it properly and isn't and you don't want to be that guy that's just like i'm going to use composite and rf and scale it the worst way possible and don't care because i don't care you should care a little bit it's your work it's your art you want it to be represented properly. Hope this video has been helpful for you. Stay tuned for part two uh, for, you know, additional hardware scaler options. We're going to be talking about a few different ways to do all of this kinds of stuff. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe for more streaming education. I'm your stream professor, Epos Fox. Uh, go check out links in the description, as mentioned already, as well as the float plane for early access to videos and behind the scenes content. Discord, if you want more help with this topic over at eposfox.gg discord. I'll see you next time.